The extent and rate of urbanization has been much debated, and those of you who came to Debbie Potts' presentation will know that there is quite some debate about that. It's very uneven across the continent. Um, it is a case of many people moving into middle size and smaller towns rather than necessarily into the mega cities. Um, but certainly there is urbanization. People are moving in um, and they're moving into cities that are simply unable to respond in terms of, of jobs, housing, services, and so on. So we have these kinds of figures, 43% of the urban population below the poverty line. Um, that is, that's extreme. 63% of jobs informal, 62% living in slums, highly uneven across the continent. So those are, are generalizations. We, we have to recognize that. Planning went through a period uh, right the way through the 1990s and 2000s where there was a fairly firm belief that the market would sort out the problems of, of cities, and all we had to do was to wait for the market to, to, to take effect. I think that changed after 2008, um, and since then there has been a, a revival, I think, not only in Africa, but br broadly, more broadly as well in the global south, um, that some kind of state intervention is certainly necessary in order to sort out um, problems such as, such as these. I think the UN Habitat's uh, global report in 2009, which was on planning, was, was a clear marker of, of that shift. Um, and certainly from, so from the end of the 2000s, planning was back on the agenda. There, there, is, there is clear acceptance um, that while planning in principle uh, is an important um, thing to have, the existing planning systems and the way the existing planning systems operate is deeply problematic. So I, I think there is a recognition that uh, planning is good, but the systems through which that operates will, will have to definitely be reformed. Planning education has to be ethically driven. It has to be Pro poor, inclusive, and sustainable. Those, those are the principles which we need to, to get across to our students. Planning education has to be contextually relevant rather than imported best practice. Um, we have to give students a good understanding of the spatial, spatial competencies. That's very important. But at the same time as being context relevant, students have to have a literacy with, with global uh, processes, ideas, and so on. So it's trying to get that global and local in, in balance. Now to finish off, what more will it take to shift planning education in Africa? And uh, as Peter and I were saying the other day, this is a, this is a very long-term project. It's an intergenerational project. It will still be going ahead beyond our lifetimes. I, I have no doubt of that. It is very slow moving. ARPS needs to grow and thrive. It's, it's a fundamental tool for, for shifting planning education, but there's no quick fix, no silver bullet. Um, it's going to take a long, a long time. It will depend as well on shifting national planning legislation. Um, without that shift, we're going to be seriously hampered. Um, and there's still, there's still some important, some important obstacles uh, in the way. There's across Africa, there's there's very little in the way of a political commitment to to cities. Um, many politicians are still very focused on their rural electorate. Um, many donor agencies are still very focused on rural development rather than urban development. Um, cities are often seen as a kind of inconvenient nuisance and are not yet taken seriously. We may look at changing planning education, but there are generations of trained planners already in, um, in the public service who would need to be retrained. And that is a massive task to, to try and, and, and do that. My argument is that if these visions and if these sustainable urbanizations are to be attained, we need to, be, to, to embrace inclusive development. I have seen planning address opportunities 
in my country, uh, you know, immediately after independence through the governments of uh, various presidents. Uh, but I have also seen planning being abused and therefore lose those opportunities and actually becoming a problem at some times. Kenya's history has unfolded through various phases. Of course, we went through colonial period and planning, I think, in, started all that way long. Uh, colonial uh, administration was very firm on planning, uh, but it was a planning for control. It was a planning for segregation. You come to Nairobi or Kenyan towns, and you can actually see the town part which was developed during colonial time, and the town part which has emerged after colonial time. The one which is which uh, 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 evolved during the colonial time has a very clear grid system. Uh, it is very orderly. The part which has grown after independence is very organic. Uh, it has been developed by people in their sp the free spirit. What I did is, I had been doing quite a lot of work with the uh, development partners, USID, you know, ODA at that time, and uh, I was invited to work with the UN. So I joined the United Nations Center for Regional Development. I felt that because there was very little to do in the university, the education or planning was not yielding any response. Planners were more or less complacent because of the repression. Uh, maybe I could do something in the United Nations. And uh, in the United Nations, I was given the responsibility of train, uh, organizing planning uh, courses and programs for Africa. One thing which also came positively in terms of uh, Kibaki government time was the government changed attitude towards slums. Instead of uh, for, you know, fostering evictions, and uh, government announced a policy change towards slum upgrading. So we began seeing actually uh, efforts by government to come up with programs of uh, slum upgrading like Kenya Informal Settlements Upgrading Program. Um, but at the same time, there were parallel to that some aspects of eviction, administrative evictions. And usually these were because uh, people in powerful positions would still use the administration to remove uh, poor people in informal settlements whenever they wanted land for their own development. Even from 1972, the country really didn't have planners as such. So I felt like uh, with my colleagues that we needed to have uh, a greater number of people trained as planners. So we started a bachelor's program in, uh, in planning. Now, we also dealt with the local authorities. Uh, a lot of times people talk about slum upgrading. Of course, that is to address issues of existing slums. But there are more slums coming. Just as urbanization is taking place, every urban, new urban center is a potential for another slum. Because if the ratio of urban in all the urban areas is about 70%, the more urban areas we get, the more slums we get. But can we prevent it? Uh, we felt that from a planning perspective, if you really engage the managers of the new towns, it is possible to prevent slums coming up. Slums come because of the way land is organized, the way land is subdivided. Uh, and if this is addressed in advance, then you prevent slums. The, there are planners who believe in control, uh, and they have been trained to that, and they believe that that is what should be promoted. Now, that is very different from a person who is willing to go and work with the communities, who believes that you can negotiate, negotiated solutions to problems. So I am basically trying to call for uh, us to continue within schools of planning, uh, from promoting these partnerships with the urban poor, uh, with the civil society, because I believe there is a solution in, the, in that kind of engagement. My question relates to something that you had up which talked about um, changing teaching or perhaps new pedagogical methods at the community level, but also the city-wide and the regional level. And I think you both talk very much about how students were engaging at the community level. But I think teaching about how to address issues of informality, especially at the city-wide and regional level, is a big challenge, and I think slum upgrading can only go so far before you have to start asking and discussing those regional questions at policy and planning levels. So can you talk a little bit about how to change the teaching of those aspects? I mean, it is important that, that students understand how to plan at different scales, 
um, engaging communities at a regional scale is, is, a, is a very different uh, issue to, to the local scale. And I think at the regional scale, you really are trying to identify who are the major stakeholders uh, rather than, than communities. Thank you for your presentations. First of all, I think Professor Watson, you showed that 62% of urban populations lived in informal settlements. And Professor McGow, you spoke of a lady who said that the tree was more important than the vote. And with a vote only every four or five years, one can understand uh, why she makes uh, that comparison. But the numbers of people living in informal settlements constitute potentially a hugely significant electoral force. Is there any evidence that people vote or vote differently and whether they are organizing themselves on the basis of their conditions of life? The structures which the poor live are not owned by the poor. They are owned by fairly well, you know, wealthy people. Some of them live in the informal settlement, others live outside. Then the the control of the informal settlement is through cartels and a lot of them are part of these voting blocks which the politicians uh, develop to hold control of the vote in the informal settlement. In South Africa at the moment we have a general election coming up probably in May next year. In Cape Town we have the opposition party in control. The last few months have seen the emergence of what is now called the toilet wars. Basically what you're talking about is communities organizing themselves very often by the ruling party um, to, to protest and it's, it's around toilets every time. That seems to be the, the, the absolutely key issue.